pray with me. Lord Jesus, through your death and resurrection, you open the way of abundant life. Help us to put aside our human desires and embrace your life. Amen. So in my house, sorting through the mail is my job. Recently, while sorting through a pile that had accumulated on the counter, I started to think that sorting the mail was a little like reading scripture. I think it might be a side effect of going to seminary. But let me explain. As I go through the mail, I put each piece into a pile. Usually, there's a pile for things that have to be dealt with right away. Maybe a favorite magazine comes or a bill that has to be paid. Then there's a pile of things that I probably should look at later when I have more time, like that envelope from Geico that offers to save me 15% on my auto insurance, but who has 15 minutes? And finally, there's a pile that goes into the recycling or the trash. Now imagine that the Bible is a little like that pile of mail. As we read through different passages, we probably are tempted to sort them. One pile might be, oh yeah, definitely the word of God. I like this passage. I'm going to keep it. Can anyone think of an example of one of those? Does anyone have a favorite Bible verse? For God so loved the world. That's a great one, Karen. You don't need the chapter and verse. You can just tell us what it's about. Anyone else have a favorite Bible passage? Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan. It's an excellent story. Good choice. So we know that there are definitely things in the Bible that we like to keep. Now let's go to the next pile. Things that might be confusing. Things that we might read in Scripture and we might not really understand. Things we say, I'll ask Pastor about that the next time I see him. Can anyone think of one of those? Today's, Campbell's head getting to the needle. Today's, yeah. I kind of thought that too when I looked at the passages I was going to be preaching on today. <laughs> Any others? How about Revelation? It's kind of at the end of the Bible there. A lot of symbolism, things we're not so sure about. So maybe we don't go there that often. We wait for Pastor to take us there. And then the final pile. The pile where maybe we read something and we say, I'm not so sure this is the word of God at all. Do any examples come to mind? I hate to say it, but Adam and Eve. But what? Oh, Adam and Eve? Yes. Okay. Blame it on the woman. You know. Blame it on the woman. Okay. Any others? I have one along those lines, too, that women should not speak out in church and should never <laughs> teach. Um, uh, Abraham with his uh, uh, request to sacrifice Isaac. Yeah, that's another hard one, right? We don't want to think that God would ask Abraham to do that. So now let's look at our readings for today. And thank you so much for helping me out with this. It seems like the gospel might be the best place to start on a regular Sunday. Sometimes the Old Testament can be a little harder to relate to. But wait a minute. As we just said, this gospel is a little difficult. Jesus tells the rich man that to inherit eternal life, he must sell all that he has, give the proceeds to the poor, and follow Jesus. What exactly does that mean? It doesn't sound like very good news to me. After all, I imagine some people might think that I'm rich. I live here in Westchester County, in one of the richest suburbs, in one of the richest countries. The idea of selling everything I have and giving it to the poor to inherit eternal life seems just a little unreasonable. So let's hold off on that for right now. Maybe we can start with Job. What comes to mind when we hear the name Job? What do we think of when we think of Job? Suffering and affliction. Say that again? Suffering, Suffering and affliction. Anything else? 
And how did Job respond to that suffering and affliction? I think we think of him as patient. I seem to, I don't know where I heard it, but I seem to remember when I was growing up hearing something like, oh, you have the patience of Job, right? Meaning that you have a lot of patience. But before we think about Job as patience, let's look a little bit deeper. Sure, maybe he sat on an ash heap covered with sores, and we say, he just kept on going, and he just kept taking all that suffering. But I think there was more to him than that. When we meet Job, he's what's considered a model citizen. He lives his life according to the law. He has family, money, friends, and he follows God's commandments. When bad things start to happen, Job is confused. He's confused because he believes he's been doing all the right things and can't imagine why these bad things are happening to him. <clears throat> As time moves on and there is no relief in sight, as Job's friends tell him he must have done something to deserve all this punishment, Job moves from confusion to anger and despair. He is angry to the point of obnoxiousness. Let's take a look at verse 6. I might read it a little bit differently than it was read earlier. Job says, Would he contend with me in the greatness of his power? No, but he would give heed to me. That's a pretty bold statement about God, and it doesn't sound very patient. If I were God, I might have struck Job down right there. But of course, God doesn't strike Job down. God loves Job despite Job's anger and through Job's anger. And Job, despite his confusion and anger, never stops believing in God. He can't see the end, but even in the deepest pit of his despair, he knows that God is there keeping his side of the covenant. So when we think about Job, Maybe rather than seeing him as the paragon of patience, we can say, yeah, that Job was pretty feisty, and he was one faithful guy. When everything of this world was stripped away, family, friends, possessions, health, Job never let go of the promise of relationship with God. So I think I would sort this reading into my keeper pile. Now let's look at Hebrews. This passage starts a little rocky too. God's word is a two-edged sword and no creature is hidden. We are all naked and laid bare before the one to whom we must render an account. It all sounds a little scary and confusing. Where is the grace in this? What about justified by grace through faith? We're Lutheran after all. No account is necessary. We can't earn God's love and mercy. We only have to believe. But when we keep reading, we get to the grace. We have Jesus, our great high priest, who knows our humanness firsthand and who advocates for us. Let us, therefore, approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I've always loved these words. When I started seminary, I had to get a new Bible. One thing I can tell you about any of the Bibles that I have in my house, none of them have any writing in them. Because I was raised that you never write in a book. Okay? Certainly not in the Bible. But this new Bible is different. I've started to highlight in this new Bible. Because I find I need to refer to passages a little more now, and I'm not real good at remembering chapters and verses. One of the first passages that was highlighted in this Bible was this passage from Hebrews. And that's because it has very deep significance for me. I've been very blessed in my life. I grew up in a family where while there were challenges, I always knew I had the unconditional love of my parents. And that love gave me the confidence to be successful. I was the first person to attend college. I graduated from Fordham 
and I went to work for one of the largest CPA firms. I got married, I bought a condo, and I had a first child. Everything was going according to my plans. I was still a member of my childhood congregation, and I was the treasurer. And even though it was a small congregation and struggling, I loved the community there, and I was so happy to be bringing my daughter into that loving atmosphere. <clears throat> when the call was around two, my husband Mark and I decided it was time to have another baby. It was the next logical step. <clears throat> then things got a little off our plan. One month, then three months, then six months went by, and I still wasn't pregnant. So, of course, we went to the doctor. There must be something wrong. We'll get it fixed, and we'll move on with our plans. But after all the testing was done, there were no answers. The doctors couldn't explain why this wasn't happening. This was a huge blow especially for someone like myself, who lives in a world of numbers, where if you just keep working at those figures, eventually you're gonna get the right answer. My prayers were like Job's. I was doing everything right. Why would God do this to me? There must be some mistake. This is not how it's supposed to be. Every time I approached God in prayer, I asked to be pregnant. And every month when I wasn't, my heart was crushed. In hindsight, while I was approaching the throne with boldness, not being afraid to ask for what I wanted, my focus was too narrow. I was asking God for what I thought was best. I was limiting the field to what I could see, and by having limits, I was really not very bold. At some point, my prayer began to change. Instead of praying to be pregnant, I prayed for comfort and patience. I'm not sure how or why that prayer changed, but when it did, there was a difference. It was still painful each month when I wasn't pregnant, but somehow, by shifting the focus from my detailed agenda, there was some comfort. But honestly, it was small. Then one day, I was reading Sesame Street magazine while Nicole was napping, and I saw a story about a family that had adopted a baby girl from China. It was like a beam of sunshine had come through the thickest clouds. My heart literally leapt. I could understand that passage about Mary when she says, the child leapt in her womb. It was this huge excitement. I knew that this was my path. And after prayer and discussion with Mark, we made our decision to move forward. And about a year later, we brought Jen home. From the instant she came to us, Jen has been our child. A blessing and a part of our family that I can never imagine being without. And as some of you may know, I now have three children. Because shortly after returning with Jen, with no thought or intention, I did become pregnant. And we went from one child to three in 15 months. When I consider these events, my understanding of boldness has changed. When we say that we can approach God's throne with boldness, it doesn't just mean confidence that we can ask for anything, which of course we can. But instead, approaching with boldness means approaching with our hearts open to possibilities of stepping beyond the limits of what we see and plan and opening ourselves to the possibilities that only God can provide. So I think we will put Hebrews in the Hebrew Bible as well. So now, let's look at this gospel. This passage in Mark is a challenging one. As a matter of fact, Pastor Paul graciously offered to have me switch to another Sunday. But I said, no, I was going to power through it. There's a lot going on here today. Let's focus on a couple points. When we enter the story today, Jesus is on a journey. 
that journey is leading to the cross. As a matter of fact, in the very next chapter, Jesus will enter Jerusalem and Holy Week will begin. Leading up to this, Jesus has been hinting, as we've heard in the last few weeks, uh, gospel lessons, he's been hinting to his disciples that something big is coming. And all they can do is argue about who's going to be first when the kingdom of God is returned. I have to wonder if at this point Jesus' human self is a little bit done. He has to be asking him by himself by now, is my ministry a failure? These ones closest to me still don't get it. So I think we could say Jesus has a lot on his mind. Suddenly, a man runs up to Jesus and kneels before him. And as is often the case, this man wants something from Jesus. He wants to know what he must do to inherit eternal life. Jesus responds by running through the commandments, and the answer comes quickly for the man, from the man. Teacher, I have kept all of these since my youth. But when we look closely at that list of commandments that Jesus goes through, we may notice that the first three are missing. The ones that deal with our relationship to God. I wonder if Jesus doesn't ask the young man if he loves God above all else, if he honors God's name, or if he keeps the Sabbath because he already knows the answer. This rich man does those as well, I assume, but only as much as his humanity allows. I think we can assume that he has a plan like many of us. He has a very clear idea of what he needs to make his life good. And this is why Jesus tells the man that he lacks one thing in order to inherit eternal life. He has to sell everything and give it to the poor. Now this seems counterintuitive. If I lack something, don't I need to get more? What this man lacks is boldness and confidence to approach the throne and blow open the limits of his own imagination and accept the incredible gift that is about to be given. Yes, he has what the world would judge to be everything he needs. Yes, he treats others with kindness and respect. Yes, he loves God and strives to keep his commandments. But what he does not see, what the world does not see, is that beyond this, there is so much more. So what then are we to do? Some scholars suggest that when Jesus refers to a camel traveling through the eye of a needle, he's referring to a narrow gate in the city where a camel could not pass through without taking off its cargo. Seems kind of silly to me that there'd be a gate like that, because why would you want to take all the cargo off the camel to get through the gate and put it back on? And in fact, other scholars dispute this story. But it kind of gets to the point where, like the camel, who is piled high with the things of this world. And make no mistake, we are piled high. It's a wonder we can even move under the weight. And when we get to that gate, it looks like we can't fit. What can we do? C.S. Lewis points to an answer in The Weight of Glory and Other Addresses when he says, If we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the Gospels, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, pulling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at sea. 
With our pile of stuff, we have what we think we need to be secure and to have life. We can't imagine how life would be without all our stuff. This is where we need God. When God created human beings, he didn't put them in Armani suits. He didn't put up a development with four bedroom houses with three car garages. All they needed was provided in the abundance of creation and all shared as needed in that abundance. They had relationships with God, each other, and creation that hadn't been broken yet by sin. But despite the brokenness of our world, God is still here working with us and wanting to open our imagination to see what this world could be when we follow God's plan rather than our own. Jesus looks on the man with love. Even as the man leaves grieving, Jesus still loves him, and I believe grieves with him and for him. Jesus looks on each one of us with love. Jesus is looking down on the font as we prepare to bring Danielle here to be welcomed into the community of Christ. He loves us despite our shortcomings, and he can see right through them. He opened the gate for us when he stepped out of the open tomb. With his death and resurrection, Jesus opened an opportunity for us to gain a measure of God's kingdom restored right here on earth. The gate may appear narrow, but because we are saved, we have been free to break open our imagination, to cast off the piles of stuff we burden ourselves with, and to live more fully into relationship with God. And when we remember the gift of salvation we have received, we can also embrace the resulting desire to share with and serve others, opening us to a new and unimagined future. So which pile will we put today's gospel in? I would suggest we put it in the keeper pile. Make no mistake, Jesus is giving us a warning. The piles of stuff we have on our backs are a problem. As C.S. Lewis so eloquently put it, we are content to play with mud pies because we cannot imagine what a holiday at sea is like. But as we know, Jesus' journey ends when he is resurrected, breaking open a new possibility that is beyond anyone's imagination. My prayer for all of us is that we can strive to approach the throne with boldness and confidence so that we can let go of the limits we place on ourselves, put aside our mud pies, and embrace the possibility for God's kingdom, both here and in the time to come. Amen.